Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. This is Nasty Neil. That would make me terrible, Troy. Mm. And we're joined by Ken Carpenter of Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, and a lot of other cool stuff. And he's going to be talking about some stuff he's working on. It's very cool to have you here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, guys. Yeah. I appreciate it. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, Hellraiser 3 on Hell on Earth. Hell on Earth. Um, how did you get involved in that? Uh, that project was brought to me by a friend of mine, uh, Lawrence Mortov, who is a producer. Uh, Lawrence is, uh, and Larry Kaplan produced it. Um, they basically, uh, had tied up. I don't think they were tied up with the Weinsteins at that time on, on the project, but they, they put it together and, uh, with Fifth Avenue Entertainment. And Larry had initially come to me and he said, yeah, I want you to do a pair of movies. And, uh, I was, I was hanging out with Dan Haggard at the time and, was going to go, uh, Dan was, uh, involved in the project. We were trying to get a, like a, uh, you know, a Western going. And so we've been working on this project for a while. So I told Larry, I, you know, I said, well, I'm really hanging out. Why I want this project to go. And he says, well, it's, you know, is it going? And I said, no. So he said, well, why don't you come and do this one? And I want you to do children of the corn too. And I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so. <clears throat> excuse me. So I said, I kept putting him off and putting him off. And finally, then they went and did children of the corn and he came back and he said, you know, man, you should have been on that project. You know, you could have done it. And I said, yeah, I probably could have. And he says, will you do Hellraiser? And I said, yeah, I'll do it. So he put it together and, um, away we went to, um, North Carolina and, um, we were shooting some multiple locations back there. Um, and it was a, a very interesting, I thought it was an interesting project. I liked the project because I carried the two characters. I carried the was camera head and I was Doc Fisher, the cameraman. Mm-hmm. And so it was an opportunity to play kind of the two different sides of evil or one side of evil and one, you know, good guy struggling. Mm-hmm. The guy, the cameraman guy was kind of a cowboy guy, you know, and then, they had it, you know, it's it kind of tricky to do in the makeup because, uh, I had a Fu man shoe and really long hair. And of course, when I became camera head, you know, like I had a skull cap on and no hair mm-hmm. and a uh, Fu man shoe had to be shaved off and then glued back on, uh, which made making dialogue a little bit difficult. But again, you know, there wasn't a lot of dialogue with that character. You know, the, the eye was mobile, you know, that was operated by remote. Uh, the lens, you know, back and forth. Mm-hmm. And, um, it took about two and a half, three hours to go into makeup. Um, with, you know, multiple, multiple layers of, uh, makeup going into it, you know, to create the really intense, and it was very, really excellent. Bob Keane was the guy that was uh, running that whole show with the special effects guys, and, uh, they were very good there from England. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, it was, a, uh, it was kind of really, it was kind of fun. It was a fascinating project to do. I, I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a call on the line, 913 area code. Who are you and, uh, where are you from? Hi, Douglas Steps from Kansas City. Oh, very cool. Do you have a question hey, for Ken? I do. I was wondering how long that makeup job took. It takes, a, it took about two and a half, three hours to go in. And then, you know, oh, and man. about an hour to coming out. Um, and, you know, it was it, like, uh, there was, I had no vision of obviously my, my one eye was good, but the other one wasn't, you know, because it was covered in a skull cap. But, um, yeah, it was pretty interesting. You know, it was, uh, I, I thought Clyde Barker was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant the way he designed some of these characters. All the center. Oh, I bet yeah, we had a good time with it. It was fun, you know. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think there was, uh, you know, people come and say, you know, what do you think about, you know, are you, you know, like, uh, it's kind of a cult thing. And I was saying, you know, I didn't think at the time it was much of a cult thing, but, you know, okay. <laughs> you it's know. a pretty mainstream movie, yeah. yeah. How long was you filming on? Uh, we were back here about, I think, three weeks, you know, and... Oh. um we were, we shot downtown, um, 
trying to think of the little town we shot in. Um, and we were on location, you know, different locations outside of town. Um, and there was one area downtown where we shot at night where they blew up all the cop cars and things that I'm trying to think that was, um, well, not, not, um, trying to think of the town, dug on it. Um, darn it. I, it, it slips in my mind the name of the town was shot in. Yeah. Um, but it was, um, it was pretty, it was really nice dealing with the North Carolina people that, you know, North Carolina is a great place to shoot. Um, they're great locations. It's really, it's kind of, um, you know, country and rural areas mostly. Um, and we had, when we shot in the nightclub, that was actually in the town of, uh, not Durham, um, doggone it. I'll, I'll, I'll think before this interview is over. I'll, <laughs> I'll think of the name of the bloody town. Um, right. But it was an interesting uh, makeup job. They, the guys were really brilliant. I thought they did a really good job with it. All, all yeah, the I mean, it's, it's one know. of my favorites. What are you saying, Doug? One of your favorites? Your uh, favorite sequel? Saying, it's, one of my favorite in, it's definitely one of my favorite in, in, the, uh, in the series. I mean, it's definitely one of the better ones. Love yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think they made. I think Hell 3 was probably, in, in my view, uh, you know, of course, you know, I'm prejudiced, but in my view, Hell 3 <laughs> was probably one of the best ones they did, too. Um, it- and they were talking, they were talking about doing a remake of the things. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're going to bring everybody back together again, you know. Um, they're threatening to have some kind of a get together in London this next year. What do you think of the new one? The I've new not seen one? it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I've not seen it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't even know if Doug Bradley is he that isn't. character. He isn't. Yeah, I didn't no. think so. Yeah, the last I mean, two. Yeah, he's not. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I, I think But I think that's a mistake. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's hard to. Uh, I think it's hard for any character that's known, but um, especially um, unlike other movies where it's a guy in a mask, which still I think people recognize you know who's playing Jason and whatnot. But uh, for someone that talks a lot, has a lot of dialogue. And uh, is present the presence is on the screen. It's hard to then replace that with somebody else. Yeah, you really can't. Doug Bradley is will always be a pinhead, and and you can't really you can't really trade him out of that spot. Mm-hmm. Um, and That's I love nice Doug. He's he's a guy. He's a hell of a guy. Um, Tony Hickok, who is the director of that project, I've been recently impressed with, and Tony is um, directing a bunch of movies over in Hong Kong. And uh, I had touched, reached out to get all of them because um, I had a picture, and they were putting together some kind of a little book thing, and I had a picture of Tony and Terry Terrell and myself. And so I sent it to Tony, and Tony said, ironically, it's in my living room. You know, they're glad you sent it to me, but I already got a copy of it. You know, it was a great picture of just the three of us. It's cool, yeah. but I had written a, a, a comedy horror, and I said I wanted Tony to look at it because I thought it would be an interesting project. And um, for him to see if he might be interested in even doing it or give me a recommendation for it. Oh, and I've not heard back from him yet, but it's we'll, we'll see what happens. I had written that project with Richard Mole, the actor uh, from Night Court. Oh, wow. Love uh, it. That's right. it was, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Doug, so, we, um, I want to thank you for calling in, Doug. It's uh, a lot of cool questions, but, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, yeah. man. All right. Pleasure talking to you, Neil. Bye. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, did you see? St- did you stay in touch with uh, with Tony Hickok over the over the years? Or you know, I'm not. I haven't touched. I haven't seen Tony since the uh, we went down to the screening. Uh, mm-hmm. I ran into Terry Farrell periodically in town because uh, Terry had run up on interviews and doing different things, and so did I. And so we'd run across each other in town when we were going out on dishes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, and other than that, and I not really talked to any of those guys, um, uh, Larry, of course, Larry and I are old friends for many, many years. So I talk to Larry all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, he's really, in fact, he's looking at a project that I recent project. I started writing books on global terrorism. I've written six so far and uh, Larry's looking them over as a possibility to put them into production. Mm-hmm. So there's an anthology of books. So, uh, um, uh, 
Were were you writing at the time, or when did you get into a, to into a, being an author? You know, I didn't start. I started authoring about ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but yeah, but yeah, about ten, twenty, twelve years ago, I had moved to Big Bear Lake from um, L.A. and um, then I had moved to Vegas for a brief stint, and I got into the u2 spy planes and things like that and when i moved back to big bear i met a u2 pilot we became good friends and he introduced me to lockheed martin skunk works and i started developing storylines that were would work through the six book anthology and um then i you know brother and they're just they're out there now um if you were to go to my website it's ken carpenter ii.com you can see the books that are out there, um, you know, that are all sequentially because they all dovetail into the next one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think they're pretty good material, you know. So we're hoping that we can get them made. We'll see. A lot of competition there, you know. Mm-hmm. And my books are written from a conservative perspective. So it's not a, it's not the typical Hollywood liberal um, you know, spiel. Mm-hmm. Do you think that would be a uh, harder to get made? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, they're, they're my, my, I'm written from the military perspectives, you know, and the, you know, as a defense supporter of a defense contractor like Lockheed Martin, which I think is the best. And, um, you know, they're utilizing the books, utilize a lot of technology, utilize a lot of political, uh, drama that's going on. And the stories uh, are very relevant to what's going on politically and globally. Um, you know, the first book is called Flight of the Angel and the Winds of Allah. And it's a story about basically about the closing of the Strait of Hormones, which, gee, that rings a bell today, doesn't it? Because yeah. we're shipping aircraft carriers and other boats are going over there today. Um, and basically the Iranians are mining the Strait of Hormones and, um, they attempt to shoot one of our U-2 spy planes down, and it's a near catastrophe over a day period of eight days, where we almost get in a war with them, with Iran. And uh, so that's kind of relevant today. Um, the second and third book is basically about development of a a nuclear weapon that's um, being made up in North Korea with uh, Chinese influence and Iranian influence. And the attempt to bring it into South America through Venezuela and into Mexico, into uh, some terrorist training camps in Mexico. And they're trying to bring them across the border into Arizona and attack the infrastructure of the United States. Um, and explode, uh, you know, a nuclear weapon. Uh, we circumvent that from happening by an astute military. And, um, we move on to the third story, which is called the Rat to Chang, which is about the South China Sea and China's building atolls on the islands of the Spratly and Brazil Islands. And, um, a couple of our agents go missing in the South China Sea. And we, one of our agents, a guy by the name of Garrity goes after him. And it's kind of an exciting story about the high peril on the high seas. And pretty much about the South China Sea, which is uh, another very contemporary story. Um, the fourth book is talks about, it's called the, um, um, it's the revolution of the, uh, not the revolution of the Patriots, sorry, it's the, um, <laughs> I gotta look at them right now. <laughs> I, it's, cause I, uh, these books are, oh gosh. Yeah, The Return of the Bolshevik, which is basically about Putin coming back into power, you know, of trying to take the Soviet Union and putting it back together. And um, it's a pretty intriguing story about uh, that involves uh, Ukraine and um, nuclear weapons and oil and gas. And uh, that uh, ends up in a kind of a shakeup, too. That, that, that story dovetails into the sixth one, which is... Um, Revolution of the Patriot, and that's a contemporary story. Of what's going on right now with Trump, and ends up in a naval battle in the Strait of Malacca uh, over 
for the shipment of weapons into Israel. Um, and it's a very contemporary story. Mm -hmm. So um, that's about all six of the books. I'm working on the seventh one called Signature. And that'll be out probably sometime this year. Mm -hmm. um, you said you wrote them with a, a military, uh, through a military perspective. Uh, so, so do you have a, did you have a background in the military? I was in the Air Force for four years. I spent two okay. years in the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington and two years and 18 months in the Philippines. Mm. Uh, I was an underly airman first class guy, but I was in, in involved in a lot of classified operations. And um, most of the, you know, I do a lot of research on my material, so mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time doing that kind of thing. Plus, at my affliction with the, the U-2 spy plane. It was really broadened my horizons when I went over to, to Lockheed Martin and became good friends with the Skunk Works people because they gave me a lot of perspective about how to develop the books, too. So, um, and they're back in my hand. I mean, they totally endorsed my project so that they'll become involved. Once we get into production, they'll, we'll be able to utilize some of their resources. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's basically it. I mean, you know, I mean, everybody, anybody can get the information they want. It's not that I was privy to any private information. It's just, you know, it's out there, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, you can get those off your website. Uh, I saw those uh, digital copies. Uh, do you have the physical copies too, or is it primarily digital copies? No, there's, you can, you can order the books through Amazon. Okay. There, you can get them digitally or you can get them hard copies. Mm -hmm. Um, if you go to my website, you can actually order me the way. Okay. Um, oh, wow. if you, so, uh, yeah, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, it's out there. I encourage you to start with one because they, they do dovetail and they, they, you, you get kind of excited going through them. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of an interesting storylines, yeah. you know, but I, I try to follow the, the, the first one is written basically as a pilot for television, because I, that's really where, where I was going to go with it. Mm -hmm. And, but then I decided after I'd written it as, as a pilot for television, that if I cut it loose in Hollywood, that somebody is going to steal the idea. So I said, you know what the hell with this, I want to turn it into a book. So when I did that, then I said, okay, the second and third, I had to, I had to create a character that was going to go, you know, a character that would be like a bond character that would go throughout the movies. Mm hmm. And uh, through all of them, and so that that character was developed, and uh, he's in all of them like that. Yeah, so, he's uh, called Charles Garrity. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, physical media is something we talk a lot about with uh, movie guests. So, um, as an author, do do you find that more people buy digital copies, or or do they get physical copies for 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 uh, books? Well, people like them free. <laughs> right, Strangely right. Enough, you know, uh -huh. people like it. So if they can get a digital copy, they like it like that. Uh -huh. So, um, and I've made that available both ways, you know, and, but I, you know, and then I finally said, you know what, you want to buy, buy it. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, doing an audio copy because mm. I'd like to narrate the books, you know, tell the story like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that there's both, a lot of people like to have a hard copy and read it and, and they can physically put it on their desk, you know, and then put it in their bookshelf and they're down or loan it to somebody. Mm -hmm. So they like it in that respect too. Uh, and they're, it's, they're written in a fairly large font. So it's easy to read. They're short chapters. They're written almost like movies, mm -hmm. like a movie screenplay, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's pretty easy reading. Yeah. So uh, the horror movie that you're thinking about, I don't, you probably don't want to give too much away, obviously, but um, I guess uh, I mean, if you don't give the plot away, but what what kind of a horror movie would you be interested in, in writing? This story basically is, it's, uh, I, I don't think you could duplicate this one. Mm -hmm. It's a story about two aging vampires that are too old to suck blood. <laughs> and they have a French nurse that steals it from the hospital and they run a whole of they up in the mountains. And they get like bombarded it. by a bunch of brownies that are float out of the woods, led by Kathy Bates, like German character, you know, that's a 
and that they did it's, it's a bloodbath. It's really it's funny, and there's a the, the funky sheriffs in it. It's it's written with the, the Marty Feldman kind of oh, you nice. know the characters kind of really fat characters. Yeah. Uh, and basically it was this story basically Richard and I were playing these two old vamps. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, so it's, it's a fun story, and I think it's, it's very well written. We have some interest in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, uh, Richard Shore is a line producer who's been working with me on stuff. And Richard uh, had found some money in Oklahoma that might be interested in it so that we would run back there and try to shoot it. And it could turn into sequels with this project because it's stupid enough to catch on you know <laughs> uh-huh. it's kind of it's the kind of thing a movie people like i mean you know <laughs> yeah. it's just, it's really just dumb awkward stupid moments <laughs> but it is it's written like uh with like marty feldman you know and those you know gene uh gene wilder just, yeah gene wilder and that kind of you know, those kind of characters you know that, mm-hmm. so i didn't you know I, I wanted to make it i didn't have any trouble writing it because it was pretty easy to write that kind of stuff mm-hmm. so are oh. um are you into horror movies or comedy what kind of movies are you into i'm into i'll tell you i'm, I'm working on a project right now it's called widowmaker mm-hmm. and it's it's the new my newest one of my newest projects and it's basically it's a it's a, a story about a kid uh like that that, that visits in a town out in the west and, and wanders down the street and sees an old shop that has a, a widowmaker on the front of it and the guy makes uh he's got wid- a widowmaker is a limb that is flies out of a tree and hits the ground hard and they're they're bulbous they have a bulbous knot in them and the sap which are they're ejected from the tree at a particular time and rather not that's when the wind blows or rain or something a bird lands on it or something like that and, a, and this 250 300 pound limb goes down mm-hmm. 200 feet to the ground and hits whatever is there and whatever is there is dead by the end of it and this basically is a story about some bank robbers involved and some other things kind of a cool story it's my stephen king attempted a stephen king kind of a uh, movie deal yeah and i'm just we're actually sitting here working on it today Oh, very interesting. So, so that it's, I like to work on that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, my next uh, space shot is going to be on basically about Mars and beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's how we're probably, that's in development as we speak. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to talk too much about that one, but uh, uh, I, I like stories like that. I mean, I go anywhere, you know. My head goes off on different tangents. I'm getting ready to move off the mountain because um, it's, it's we're at 7,000 feet up here, and mm-hmm. I have COPD, and it's very hard. I have oh, to have, a, you know, sad. like a compressor giving me oxygen, you know, most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I'm down the mountain, I don't use it at all. But So I'm going to move down into the Malibu area. Yeah. Uh, Troy and I are brothers. Our mother has a COPD. She's diagnosed, you know, last year with it. Well, it's fixable, you know, if you get $10,000. <laughs> yeah. Stem, stem cell research will take care of it. They take your blood out and put new blood in and it's gone. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I know yeah. they can do that with um, with different um, hepatitis now. <laughs> Uh, you which used to not be curable, but they could. They have a same idea. They take all your blood out and and, and transfuse it with a uh, completely new blood. Well, that's what they they can do with this thing. Hmm. But I mean, it's I think it's seventy five hundred if you're a vet. But I don't have seventy five hundred right now, so I'm going to move down the mountain. Yeah, and uh, wait until I get seventy five hundred. <laughs> right. But you might, you guys uh, bank a lot of cash on these radio programs. You got to do that for your mom. <laughs> we would. I, I didn't even know that was possible. So it was something we'll have to look into, we'll look into for her. Or she can look into it, too. She's a, yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's $10,000 is a lot of money, but, mm-hmm. but it, it's, it's a quality of life. Ten, yeah. yeah, 10 years of your life and then 20 years of your life and your grandkids and great grandkids and, you know, beyond, you know, then it's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it's well worth it. Mm-hmm. 
So it was real quick was uh, when when Doug had called in, he thought uh, he talked about you know filming um, Hellraiser three in the uh, in a city there. Did you did you ever walk around with like the the the, the makeup or costume on and like any local people see you guys and wonder what's going on? We had a you know when they got me rushing me out of makeup that one night we were getting ready to shoot that night mm-hmm. and um oh God, I can't think of the name of the town. And the streets were all pretty quiet, you know, because they blocked off everything. And um, so when they got me out of makeup, they had a guy that had to walk around with me because I, you know, I wasn't, I couldn't navigate them on my own. Mm-hmm. But I did notice there was a bunch of people down at one end of the, you know, the street. And they were all standing down there just kind of looking. And they were probably 300 yards away. Um, so I said, you know, I just wandered down that way. And I said, the old boy is with me. Well, I don't know if we can do that, Mr. Carpenter. And I said, come on, man, let's just get some exercise here. So we walked down toward these people. And the closer I got to them, I noticed there's something very odd about them. And, um, it's, it turns out that they all, the guys had, they were a group of Down syndrome kids. And, um, they were, they'd been brought to the set by their, mentors or attendants mm-hmm. and so the closer we got to him i said you know hey guys you know here you can't touch my face or makeup but you can touch my costume mm-hmm. but um this is all make-believe you know that you know mm-hmm. and they were like whoa wow you know all this kind of stuff and they first took some pictures and and then um all of a sudden i heard from the other end of the street carpenter what the fuck are you doing <laughs> you know, I said, "Uh oh!" And he's a, and, a, and a producer, one of the producers, is get him out of there. This is supposed to be a closed set. You know, we don't want anybody taking pictures. Nobody's supposed to see these guys before. You know, mm-hmm. and get him. You know, get him away from there. <laughs> yeah. So they rushed me out of there and took me away from the public. But I thought it was cool. So I, you know, at least I got some to be with a few people that were cool. You know, and they, I'm, I'm sure that they appreciated it. Yeah, they got course. a couple, a couple it's pieces probably, out of it too. Yeah, yeah, it's probably a cool memory that they talk about. Oh yeah. A mm-hmm. uh, question oh. here from uh, Facebook: Loki Pace wants to know, was it uncomfortable having the uh, the bulky piece uh, over your eye? It um, was well. The the way it worked was, I had long hair right down my shoulders. Mm-hmm. So they pulled all my hair, wadded it up and rounded it around and put it in a bun in the back of my head. Then they put a white skull cap on so that I had no hair you could see. Then once they did that, then they attached this lens, kind of, it was like a on a harness. It went over my eye. It was lightweight. Didn't weigh a lot. I mean, a couple, maybe a pound. And then over that, then they put the the cap itself. I mean, the 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 main main uh, prosthetic over all of my, and so that would show an ear, and you know where where the thing that where there was a, a harness coming or a a line coming out of my ear, which operated the camera, and. Then it all went around, down around my neck. Um, so the only area in my face that was visible would be around my eyes, my nose, and my mouth. Mm-hmm. And they had to shave off my Fu Manchu uh, mustache. And the way they did that is they glued it. And I can spray some shit on it <laughs> and then cut it off. And saved it, preserved it, so that they could glue it back on. At the, because I had other scenes to do as Doc, mm-hmm. and um, so they did that like that. And then, they, and then, of course, once all of that went on, then they started applying these multiple courses of makeup, which was like twelve, thirteen courses of makeup. And you know, as far as the uncomfortableness of it, yeah, yeah, it was uh, uncomfortable, but not. Oh, not overwhelmingly so. It was it was it was more interesting than anything else, mm-hmm. you know. Even though I was going to be in it and you know out of it, uh, we had to do that. I think two days we had to do this that kind of stuff. 
so that it took three and a half hours to shoot maybe a two hour section uh, a sequence you know we were walking through the streets or when I plunge a guy's face or I'm chasing Terry down the street um, so it was, it was pretty easy stuff you know mm-hmm. it wasn't complicated at all and, and it was not uncomfortable it was more I was more fascinated with it you know and what little movement I had to do uh, it took care of it. I mean, I didn't have to do anything hardly. Uh, mm-hmm. the visual was enough to, you know, to carry the story. Yeah. So I, mean, I had very little dialogue. Mm-hmm. You mentioned, you know, uh, meeting the guys again, you know, doing the conventions before you started doing the conventions. Did you, um, <clears throat> did you know that, you know, Hellraiser three had such a following? I had no idea. I had no idea. I mean, I, I, I did when I got to Germany, and when I got to England uh, a couple of times, uh, I got over there and I realized that there was a, a good sense of following, you know, mm-hmm. people that really enjoyed and, you know, followed along. I, I, I'm i still baffled by how people can be so fascinated with it, you know. I was supposed, I was supposed to go to, uh, uh, we were going to go to, uh, we we're going to Scotland this year. Mm-hmm. And I was going to take my son Jordan with me. Um, Jordan works for the union. He's a driver for the 399. And so, but he wanted to go with me. And he, you know, because I have COPD and had the issue of carrying a compressor with me and stuff like that. It was kind of, he was like good to have kind of my nursemaid. But I got the pneumonia at the last minute and couldn't go. But they were going to, I wanted to go over there because I really wanted to meet the people and some of the people from the Game of Thrones because. I'm fascinated with that series. I think it's such a brilliant series. Mm, I love it too. Um, and I wanted to meet those people, you know, cause I, I wanted to get on there one time, uh-huh. you know? Um, uh, so it was kind of interesting, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, what did you think of the, uh, cause a lot, uh, I loved it, but for some reason there's a lot of people who didn't like the, uh, the end of game of Thrones, but, uh, what did you think of the finish? Did you, if you got to see I it? I thought it was brilliant. I thought they did too. a good job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they did a really hell of a job. I thought it was. It, was, I, it kind of surprised me that she died. Mm-hmm. I didn't think that she would die, but she did. You mm-hmm. know, I, I you know, and I kind of said like, I kind of, I thought, well, that's fucked. <laughs> you know, but uh, on, on the other hand, I, I can see where they had to have the story. They had to have it in somewhere. I think that there's going to be more of it. Yeah, there's talks of uh, doing spinoffs, and I think they kind of set that up where there's, you know, people going to different areas where, you know, they could follow. They're going to come up with, she's going to have a kid somewhere that's going to be, and it's going to be raised by the dragon or, (laughs) hell, I don't know, something, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, the dragon's going to come back into it. The dragon was really good. I thought they did a really good job of the dragon. Yeah, I was quite fascinated. I picked this story up this year. Mm-hmm. I didn't even watch this this show for years. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you I went back seen it from the very beginning. No, no, not at all. So I went back, and I, you know, that's about three months ago, two months ago, and sat down and started watching it twenty four seven, and every episode from uh, until I got up to what it is, you know, until it finished, mm-hmm. and so that I had kind of a good, and I'd have to watch it again to really get a good sense. And I think that they probably count on people watching this thing two and three times. Right. Uh, it's kind of like Lonesome Dove. You know, you're going to, you know, you keep watching that show because it's so good. Mm-hmm. You want to see it again and again. Um, so I think that, that, that they're going to have a capture audience uh, to watch it again. Mm-hmm. And I think that there will be more of it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, because there's so many characters and so many. Uh, it's very uh, smart show. And they call back to things that happened in previous Season, so the more you, you the more familiar you are with it, uh, the more you're gonna, you know, enjoy what's happening and pick up on, on some of the smaller things. Yeah, and I think that the, one of the good things, well, the, the thing about, I'll tell you something, with Hellraiser, my, and I didn't really research Hellraiser when I got into it. I I read the script on my on the airplane going out there, um, and I, you know, and sort of. You know, gave myself an idea of what I didn't want to. 
you know, re- I just I wanted to be as fresh as I could at the project. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but the one thing that I got out of it was that where in the hell did this box come from? You know, <laughs> and, and uh-huh. so I I was I was baffled throughout the whole movie. Where did this box come from? You know, and so when I'd have conversations with Doug Bradley, I'd say, you know, we got where's the origin of this thing? You know, and it's got to have an interesting origin. You know, I think that's and should have been the next sequence in the in the, in the uh, yeah. overall pictures. When I when I talked to Peter Atkins, who was a writer on it, and I said, Pete, you know, when he was getting ready to write a sequel to L three, um, I said you should go space, uh, and he did. Mm-hmm. And I said, if you do that, write me a character role in it. So yeah, I will. Well, he didn't. Yeah. But, this is okay. I don't care. <laughs> you know, but. And Doug, I ran into Doug when we were back in, I guess, in Philadelphia someplace. Mm-hmm. And Doug said, I didn't say anything, man. He said, I, that was not my idea. I, I didn't give your idea up. And he said, you know, that was Pete Atkins. And I said, yeah, I know. I <laughs> care. Sure. You know, I said, but I think it, what what they should do with, with, uh, with the next one that they make out of this sequence should be like they did with, uh, what was the guy, Anthony Hopkins, played the character. Uh, oh, Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, and then they then they finally went back to the origin of Hannibal Lecter mm-hmm. to the kid, and I think that should they should do that with the box where the box came from. They should give it an origin like that, mm-hmm. you know. And um, but they don't have apparently not enough good writers working on stuff like that recently. Um, although you never know, Tony Hickard might. Uh, get unloaded and decide to do something. You know, he's Tony's a very talented guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, mm-hmm. I also want to uh, ask about because uh, it's uh this one is a cult movie, Elves, which uh, I, I I have a soft spot for uh for horror uh, Christmas movies, and uh, so what was it like to make Elves? And uh, Dan Haggerty, uh, Grizzly Adams was was on there. Uh, what was what was Dan Haggerty like? Oh, uh, Dan, I've known Dan for years. Dan, I worked on Dan, with Dan on three, four projects. Mm-hmm. So, and he just passed there the last year or so. Mm-hmm. And, but Dan and I were old friends. Uh, my family hung out with him over the years. My kids grew up with his kids. Uh, we were good friends. And, uh, so when they called me and asked if I wanted to do this project with Dan up in Colorado, I said, sure. So, um, I was on my way. I would, I was on my way up there to meet my family in Colorado, and then I met Dan in Colorado Springs, which is where we shot the movie. And so uh, we were staying at a motel there, and they had some interesting characters who were also part of the part of the crew, and one included one uh, German guy. Uh, his name is Hans. Can't remember his last name. But to, so Dan and I would we, we would have a, a pattern of. And then when we got done shooting, you know, and usually, you know, and then on a weekend, we had free weekends. So we'd go up to the Broadmoor Hotel and go up to the skeet range and shoot skeet. Mm-hmm. And so um, we uh, we invited um, Hans to go with us uh, on this one occasion. And, of course, Hans had never shot skeet before, so he didn't know Jack. So uh, we got him out there. And he's like, this is what you do, Hans. You stand on this platform and you... You know, you'll pull and a skeet flies out and you pull your weapon up and try to knock the bird out of the air, clay bird out of the air. Is he going to send that? So we then went up and pulled him, pulled him and shot it out of the air. And, and I went up and I said, okay, this is how you do it. And I pulled. And I think I shot and I don't know if I missed him or hit mine, but it, whatever. And it became Hans's turn and he, he uh, stepped on the plate. And he said, you'll pull. And the ski flew out and he blew a hole in the fucking concrete about 10 feet away. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, whoa, whoa. And Haggerty looked at me and said, uh, hey, uh, Hans, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to shoot it in the air, you know? <laughs> 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 and so and he says, no, we'll try it again. And so, so we backed off a little bit, you know, because this guy was uh, looking to be kind of dangerous. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, uh, he he stepped on the platform again, yelled pull, and he pulled, 
And this time he blew a hole in the concrete about two feet in front of his feet. <laughs> and, and fucking Haggerty says, okay, that's a wrap. We ain't doing this anymore. <laughs> and, and so we, we took hands and went back down the hill and we were going down high. He Haggerty looked at me and said, Hans, you're well known now as Hair Trigger. <laughs> Hair Trigger. So he became known as Hans Hair Trigger. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a, it. Was a funny story, but uh, mm-hmm. we had a good time shooting that movie. Elsa's is kind of an off the wall movie. I got busted. Yeah, it's very. Strange. I got I, I got busted for being because it was a non union movie, right? Uh-huh. And you can't do. You're not supposed to do non union movies. So Haggerty didn't get in much trouble because he's you know he was just he's a maverick anyway. Mm-hmm. But I got busted, and so did um, uh, who's the guy in motorcycle cop? What's his name? Um, not sure. He was up there too, shooting a movie too. He's from Colorado. What's his name? Um, you know, there was a pair of the highway patrolmen, motorcycle cops. One of them was Larry something or other from Wyoming, and the other one was uh, the Mexican guy. Um, um, I'm not sure. Um, trying to think. Anyway, he got into trouble too for working on a non union movie. So we had to go in and apologize to the whole armada of. <laughs> photographers and people sag uh-huh. and promise never to work on another non-union movie. <laughs> so they take that very seriously. Oh, well. Yeah, very seriously. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, that was one of the reasons. They made me give them all their money back, too. Eric oh, really? Estrada, was, was that him? Hell of a lot of money, yeah. I kind of got screwed on that one. <laughs> but it was was that the guy? Was Who's that? Eric Estrada? Is that who it was? Eric Estrada. The guy from Chips? Exactly right. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's exactly it. It was Eric Estrada. And I ran into him. I was down <laughs> in the Hollywood Boulevard one time. And it was a night in Hollywood Boulevard. It was full. And we're driving down the boulevard. We came to a crosswalk. And Eric was getting ready to cross the street. And I yelled at him. and said, hey, Eric. Hey, dude. How you doing, man? You working on any more in Don Union movies up in Colorado? <laughs> and he was with a bunch of who could do floops, you know. And they're all looking at him like, what the fuck? <laughs> he ignored me. He didn't like that at all. I enjoyed giving Eric some shit, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, he's a cool guy. He's a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, how how you know. did you get? How did you get into acting? I was. Uh, up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I went to school at the University of Wyoming, and in the summers, I was a river guide at Jackson Hole Grand at uh, Yellowstone, the Grand Teton National Park, Jackson Lake Lodge. And I'd done that for like three or four years, summers. Every summer, I was up there, you know, guiding people down the, you know, the uh, majestic snake and these twenty-two foot bridge pontoons. You know, they're like um, well, they're eighteen feet long, actually. And, um, you know, you carry like 12 people on it. And then you give a spiel. There's a, there's an oarsman on the front with a sweep and one on the back. And you sweep your way down the river, you know, given a, you know, a dissertation on, on the wildlife and the archaeology, geology, physiology and stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, you know, uh, I really, uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, it was, it was a good time for me. And so at the last year I was up there, I was working and it was like, uh, um, the, the movie Warner brothers came up there to shoot a movie called the unexpected Mrs. Polifax spy mm-hmm. with, um, with, um, John Beck and Nehemiah Persov, Harold Gould, Rosalind Russell, Darren McGavin. Um, and my, uh, there, I was li- dating a gal from the, Pink Garter Theater in Jackson Hole, um, in the town of Jackson. Mm-hmm. And they asked me if I was getting ready to, you know, finish the river trips and said if I was interested in working on a movie. And so I said, sure. So I became an Albanian soldier working on that movie. And when Warner Brothers wrapped it up up there, uh, they took me to LA with them. I said, come on to LA. And I flew into LA and lived with John Beck on, on the beach in Venice for two years. And, Worked on movies and became a member of the Screen Extras Guild and worked on all kinds of different projects. And then eventually became a member of the Screen Actors Guild. 
and and doing an interview on the radio here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my son just got home. Oh, okay. Uh, so it was it was a good opportunity for me to get involved and, and do it. And Warner Brothers is cool. They were really good guys. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a, basically how I broke into the business. Mm-hmm. So uh, but, you know, before that, like, uh, were there any movies or actors or anything that like uh, got you interested? Like, this is something I would like to pursue. Well, I mean, you know, I sure everybody wants to be like John Wayne. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody wants to be like Clint Eastwood. You know, uh, but uh, yeah, there were guys. You know, I mean, sure. I mean, I had a when it was I went to Baylor University. I had a drama scholarship when I first uh, graduated from high school. Went to Baylor and was there for a year before I flunked out. Came home was a river guide and a hunting guide. And I joined the Air Force, went to the Air Force for four years and came back to the University of Wyoming and then went, graduated, you know, went to the University of Wyoming for four years, got a BA, mm-hmm. was going to go to law school, was engaged to the only congressman in Wyoming, Tino Roncalio was his name, and his daughter, um, and I were engaged to be married, I was going to go on to law school and all this good stuff, we president of the young democrats met bobby kennedy and all this good stuff mm-hmm. and then uh, we broke up and it uh, you know in the middle of that and a movie came along and i said adios and uh, away i went to hollywood i never mm-hmm. looked back mm-hmm. cool and then i spent you know a lot of time in aspen colorado up there running wild rivers and working on different projects mm-hmm. so uh um, yeah that's so only I know you can get uh, your books, as you mentioned, at Ken Carpenter II, Ken Carpenter Two II, dot uh, com. Uh-huh. And um, do you have any upcoming appearances or anything at, uh, at conventions? Or uh, they're talking about bringing me back to England uh, sometime oh, nice. this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm moving off the mountain in August, and I want to put together a Scotland trip, another Scotland trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been, they're also talking about bringing me back to, uh, uh, North Carolina or, or, or I'm not North Carolina, um, Tennessee mm-hmm. for a meeting back there, kind of a celebrity event. Um, and of course, if there's an Oklahoma shoot opens up, I'll go up there and shoot that, mm-hmm. but I'm going to be probably near and dear to Hollywood because I'm trying to put these books together in a big, if I can put this anthology together, I'll be b- pretty busy for the next time five years mm-hmm. so um anyway yeah that's that's the kind of the thing i mean i if my website uh or facebook would will show or reflect any kind of event that i'm going to be going to mm-hmm. i'll put it out there you know i'm on my way to smallville or wherever you know yeah so what where what's it on uh facebook just like up ken carpenter or? yeah kenny carpenter and you'll just see my you know my face right. and um it'll have a, it'll have a few things on there and my books are on there too mm-hmm. so i'm also on linkedin i'm also on linkedin and i'm also on twitter but i am not big on twitter and i'm and quite frankly i'm not even that impressed with facebook uh-huh. yeah you i'm know, not but i'm not a big fan of the twitter either but uh i don't know I like the face. I like Facebook. But. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are things, you know, and you know, certainly opportunity. Also, um, I guess there's some, you know, also IMDb. I'm on mm-hmm. in that movie database, and that is keeps track of you too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but I mean, if there's anything that comes up, I'll, I'll certainly put it out there. All right, very cool. And you what? can just friend, just friend me on Facebook. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, talking to us. Had a good time. Yeah, it's a pleasure, guys. I really appreciate it. It was a good opportunity. You know, uh, um, and good luck to you guys' show. And, um, you know, we'll, uh, if something changes, uh, you know, come back and we'll have another conversation. Sounds good. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. And, I hope, and I hope that I've been interesting to your guests. Definitely. I enjoyed it. a lot it. of fun. And Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, boys. 
All right. Well, take care. Right. And, uh, have, have a good night. All right. Thank you, sir. Yep. Bye. Bye.